Do you have a favorite? Not meant to. But mostly the unloved ones, the unvisited ones, the cases that get dusty and ignored. All the broken and shunned creatures. Someone's got to care for them. Who shall it be if not us? Yes. Welcome to Rune Soup, a weekly podcast about magic, culture, and the very best new and old ideas for living in this world. Coming to you from 43 degrees south on a small farm in deepest Tasmania. My name is Gordon, and I shall be your host. This week, in what is by now an annual tradition, we welcome back to the show Alkistus and Peter of Scarlet Imprint. And, for 2018, this yearly state of the world approximately coincides with Halloween, so it does double duty as our special Halloween episode. So, inevitably, we talk witchcraft and the wider culture, along with the role of landscape and improved understanding of angels, tarot cards, books, and all that good stuff. Enjoy. Peter and Alkistis, has it really been a year? Welcome back. Well, if you move to Australia, Gordon, then then we we're gonna we're gonna have these problems. We are, we are, and not just Australia. The edge of it, the very the, the most antisocial or least social edge possible. Well, I, I think that's we what can, we've done too. Yeah, we, <laughs> we, we can share an antisocial as we're we're seven hours from London. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, actually, uh, this is a really good place to start because we both have kind of um, dramatically changed geography. Uh, in the semi-recent past, uh, you guys are now, as you say, at the edge of Cornwall, uh, a place, I mean, I loved where you lived before, but, uh, a, you know, a remarkable corner of the world. So what's that been like? How is, how, how is Cornwall? Oh, it's amazing. We've been, we've been sort of in exile, well, I've been in exile from Cornwall since growing up here. So I've been out since of county university. since, since university. So it's been a, it's been a long absence. Um, and it was it was lovely to be in Shropshire, where we were on the border of the with Wales, with Wales and um, just down from Snowdonia, and that was a very wild landscape to be in. It was very very uninhabited, and there were a lot of amazing forests that we could just walk out out of the door into. But but it's it's the the elemental appeal of Cornwall is really really kind of where my heart lies. So it, it's it's just incredible to be back. The light and the weather. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're quite you're quite near. Well, you are closer, shall we say, to St Ives than where you were before. When you mentioned the light, uh, that's been a place that has been picked up by English painters for for quite some time. That you get really, really good light there. Yeah, yeah. The the light's staggering in Cornwall. I mean, it's uh, it's a constant epiphany. So you you see that with the St Ives School and the New Lynn School. The effect of the effect of the light on artists has been been very profound. Um, I mean, it, it wasn't simply people coming down here for ale. for cheap rent or ale. <laughs> um, the, the the landscape and the the quality of the light is constantly changing because we're 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 surrounded by sea on on pretty much all sides, and the the light bounces off the granite all the time. It's so it's very dynamic and shifting, and this it feels like such a strong presence. Wonderful, and you're coming out of summer. Uh, did you get much surfing in? Yeah, it's been amazing. I was out today. I was uh, surfing with surfing with the grey seals today off um, off Gwydion, and it was uh, beautiful, beautiful sunny weather. Thanks to uh, thanks to climate change and the, the the collapse of the weather systems, we've um, we've been getting the good part of that at the moment. At the moment, yeah, literally, <laughs> literally, why riding that wave of destruction? Yeah, 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 yeah literally. literally. <laughs> we we've, we've seen already some some major changes down here with. With snow last winter and snow in Cornwall is is almost an impossibility due to the amount of salt content in the air, um, and we were we were cut off from England, which is which is just unheard of. So the the global weirding is in is in full effect, and we we're, we're very much in the in the teeth of the storm here. So um, for for the, for the few listeners who don't know where Cornwall is, it's the it's the claw sticking out at the bottom of England. So we we stick out into the Atlantic, and the next thing. Um, that you hear from Cornwall is is America um, or or Ireland if you head up. So we're we're really we're really exposed to 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 the full Atlantic storms, which which is perfect for the kind of work we're doing. And uh, Alkistis, how has surfing school been going for you? 
Um, not so well. <laughs> <laughs> it's a new challenge because I have to manage my my panic attack reaction in a in a completely moving environment that I can't control. So <laughs> the waves don't stop. You can't do anything about it. You just. <laughs> But luckily, Peter's been like throwing me on small waves, and I've been getting some like speed kicks. Yeah, there's a good uh, sort of meditational lesson in that, isn't it? It's just y- oh, you, yeah, yeah. you can't win; you just have to roll. Yeah, you have to take a deep breath and go down. Hope <laughs> 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 that is over when you come up. Yeah, I think this is one of the, the fundamental, um, elemental um, things that you get taught when you live in an environment like this, and particularly when you when you venture out into the sea is. Mm. Um, all your ideas of how large or how powerful you are are, are kind of taken away when you're when you're held under the Atlantic, mm. um, and you, it does what it wants with you. Uh, and I think that's a very valuable lesson. But I think it's interesting as well because I just started this year learning uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu as well. So I have also the experience of being like smushed and ground into like the the, the mats, the training mats by opponents because I don't know anything yet. So it's similar to the sea that you are you're at the mercy of someone else and your body is actually being made in confrontation with either the elements, the ocean or other people and all these kind of endeavors practices are really they they show you how much you are a product of your environment and the people around you and the things around you even more i mean as much as your own spirit so your spirit comes out to meet these situations these encounters and that's really been my learning this year very much how much it's not like the the the, what i am is not a product of my own volition but as much the volitions of others around me and others including like ocean (laughs) things like this yeah so i can uh i can resonate with that uh this year the, the, there's things you can do and things you can't do and in our case when when you get a southerly you you stay indoors uh or watching things grow or having them die or having them attacked because there's no way you can uh, uh there are more birds than there are me and so <laughs> there's not a lot i can do about it. <laughs> uh that's been it's been it's been a particularly physical year um i you know i bought a essentially a half million dollar fat camp so um that's <laughs> yeah, that's to be expected i suppose but i can i can really resonate with the uh exploration of the borders of me i suppose yes yeah i guess especially with a farm because you're engaged in this process of nurturing the land as well and seeing what it does like really so close yeah, yeah. that's it's um i'm i'm attempting to nurture uh but it's definitely <laughs> uh, becoming aware of it and and in i guess communication and 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 sort of shared experience of it and that's been fascinating to watch because i like planning things and as everyone else because i'd only recently done the pdc so and i knew this was going to happen but it's still a surprise when it does I had to kind of complete my design certificate for this property at the end of last year. So I came down here with like, well, we'll do this and this will happen then and this and this and this and um, all very nice and ordered when when different um, species go in the ground and, and so on. And it all just went to shit. Uh, but it went to shit in, a, in the sense that I became more aware of what the land wants to do and, and what's right for me and the land in this context. And it, that's been incredible that's been incredible to kind of let go of so it's very similar actually to sort of let go of some of the ideas of what i wanted it to look like uh and sort of experience what it will look like in in communion that seems a little too romantic in conjunction with me i think is a better way of describing it yeah yeah we had our own attempt at farming well we're still undergoing it and we got those some raised beds in the garden and we thought well we'll grow some vegetables and i discovered that sparrows love rainbow chard (laughs) (laughs) they were in there every morning like nibbling it and it was it's really like i'm so happy that i'm feeding the local birds i was more happy about that than, (laughs) than upset about missing out on the vegetables See that? Um, we're going to be putting in uh, polyculture berry hedges around most of the property. And we've got only about 10 uh, raspberry in at the moment. And my neighbor, whom I got the actual um, raspberry canes of, said, well, aren't you going to net them? And I'm like, then what will the birds eat? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's yeah. been our principle too. <laughs> yeah. In, uh, in addition to Cornwall, uh, you've also left Cornwall quite a bit this year. This seems to was this your most travelly year? You think? 
Yes. Yeah, it was. It, that wasn't the plan either. We were. We were, we were planning have, a writing year. This was meant to be a quiet writing year where I where I had Finished. a chance to 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 sit down and get practice just written out. And we've just been yeah we've just been thrown thrown everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, it's been a little reactive. So we've been to we've been to America twice um, this year um, to the Flambeau Noir conference in Portland, and most recently to the texts and traditions. Colloquium, yeah, in Seattle, um, and we haven't been to America for for eleven nine. years, nine years, nine years, nine years. Stop exaggerating. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Alcistus, I, I feel yeah. like there's more. There's you guys. You were doing so, uh, some dance oh, things yeah, a couple yeah. of times in Europe. Yeah, and in was it January or February? I was dancing in Luxembourg, and I've got I did a dance in Portland. And I've got another one coming up in just under a week now in, in Paris. Um, Paris. Ah, so. splendid. That, I wasn't sure if the Paris one had happened yet. <laughs> yeah. yeah um, it's uh, mm-hmm. another thing. It, it appears we're living parallel years because this was to be a quiet writing year <laughs> myself. Yeah. It wasn't necessarily the um, the travel, although there's been more of it than I expected. It's It's funny. Like I feel like it will work for you guys as well. I feel like if you could kind of put yourself – Right out on the edge of things. Eventually, yeah. eventually you will get that sort of. I mean, Colin Wilson. It worked for him. Eventually, you can get right out <laughs> on the edge of things and and just get the books done. But uh, not this year. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. This year, this year had different plans for all of us. I think. All right. So uh, the events you did in the US uh, had some presentations associated with them that kind of align or um, I guess, hang together in, in some way, shape or form. So this is one of the things that I think would be an interesting discussion. And it's sort of about uh, angels and, and angelology and, and, and how we think with something that with this topic that maybe we've let slide over the last couple of hundred years. Uh, uh, but not, not always. I mean, you, you find quite a bit more angel stuff than people realize in, in cunning traditions. And it was certainly, you know, in the early modern era and Renaissance and so on, certainly a, quite a big deal. But uh, what would you like to see happen from a magical perspective in, in a general sort of discussion around or working with angels? I kind of like to see it um, rescued from the idea that angel magic is simply something that's, that was done by, um, a small group of the of the upper class in the interests of power in one brief period of history. Um, I mean, very much the the English angelic magic tradition tends to be seen um, in that in that in that kind of shape. When um, when you look at the excellent book that we're doing with um, with Phil and Al um, later next year, with um, with a rather monstrous. Um, characters performing their their elite angel magic in that um and with the work of d in terms of the way that the angels formed empire what i wanted to do with my talks was to remind people that there's also um there's also a radical um angelic tradition which is opposed to the angels of the nations um and to look at the to look at the the nature of the angels as we've inherited them from the from the Book of Enoch and the, the fallen angels in particular. And so I've been doing a lot of work um, looking at and um, conversing with those particular angels and tracing them back. So for people who've read um, Princeps, um, in Princeps I talk a lot about the mighty dead um, and the angels as being, um, being very connected to... Um, to the cults around the mighty dead and to the the, the stone age remains that that were found um scattered across the holy land um and that etiology in the story of giants and then when you come to one enoch you would expect to find um something similar but when you when you examine the names of the angels you find that they're they're largely angels of the weather um and they're largely angels concerned with the this this portion of the year that we're moving into um the um the powers of flood and storm and lightning and um catastrophic weather events rather than rather than the kind of weather events that you have under one's control 
And what, what I found particularly interesting is that, that these angels don't have national boundaries because they are literally the weather. They can, they can move in, in time and space and, uh, you know, violate the boundaries of nations. And so having moved to Cornwall, I've been... Um, Which are artificial boundaries anyway. Sure. Um, Man-made. I've been looking at how how these angels can be found within within the ritual landscape that I find myself in here, because we have this, obviously this isn't the ancient Near East, um, but what we have is um, we have those stone monuments with no largely no names or texts associated with them. We have um, we have those close relationships with the storm in the way that the Phoenicians did. And perhaps most interestingly in West Cornwall, there's um, a consistent tradition. The, the, the talk that I gave on, the talk that I gave on ritual magic in Cornwall at the Museum of Witchcraft this year, um, which I'll put out in Brazen Vessel, um, it's called The Shining Land because Cornwall, um, and particularly, particularly West Cornwall, um, was associated with tin production in the ancient world. And the Phoenicians, um, who worshipped the the god slash angels, which we find in Enoch, were some of the earliest visitors here and were trading with tin with the coast, um, literally where we are now. So there's a kind of strange um, angelic connection with the weather and the, the Phoenician winds. gods and the trade winds and uh, and the the stone circles and the um, the etiologies and the stories concerned with giants. Um, um, giants are another really important part of Cornish law. Um, so where, uh, just just on the, aside from that, where where we are in Cornwall, we're in the most we're in the most southerly town in in England, um, and so uh, what, literally literally down the street in Helston, um, which which sounds dangerously like Helstone for a reason because uh, the devil. Um, the devil was vanquished here allegedly by St Michael, who uh, who who threw a large stone at him, the Hell Stone, which is now embedded in uh, in one of the local pubs here called the Angel. Um, so we're we're in a we're in an, we're in a place where what was what was clearly an, an older series of giant stories, because the giants are always concerned with with wrestling. They're always concerned with. Um, these particular stones and these kind of events has been overwritten by Christianity um, and by a Michael cult. So we're in a we're in a very curious kind of um, uh, cut up space where there is a, a whole variety of these time signatures and these these cultural influences in um, in a, in a quite strange part of the world. I, I'm I'm not sure people realize quite realize how how odd Cornwall is. I mean, when when you get this far down west, it's described as the tropics. Um, because it's it's both bleak, but we have we have banana trees, we have palm trees. You know, it's um, we have datura. We have datura growing very successfully. We've got you know, it's a very very mixed environment, and the the sense the sense and the presence of the angels moving here on the weather um, has has been pretty fundamental in what I've been doing. Um, but they've also kind of like uh, blown me in some some different directions this year so so the the text the text hasn't happened but but other texts have um so i've i've actually got a collection of i've got a collection of these which will be in brazen which which i think i think is helpful for showing the direction that praxis goes in because you know praxis isn't obviously you know a single single book it's it's an ongoing process it's an ongoing angelic conversation yeah it occurs to me St. Michael was very busy in Cornwall. Very, yeah. yeah. There's a there's a there's a few spots along that coast, and I, I know exactly what you mean about the the oddness of the climate uh, of the quote unquote tropics. There, it's also home to some of the oddest sort of 19th century gardens when you know all this stuff yep. was coming back from the rest of the empire and the rest of the world and so that you can still visit some of them today but the things that you can grow because of its shape and where it is it lends itself to really unusual microclimate so you can be in this valley where you can get yeah bananas or or, or tropical flowers growing and then as you say then this year it also snowed <laughs> yeah 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 it is summer isle yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm quite taken by the um, angels of the weather idea because there's so much to sort of pull on there. Given that it's 
it's a subset or it's useful to think with in association with the idea of uh, the spirits of the air being this really yeah. big and under-examined, contemporarily under-examined notion of the spirits we, we inherited at, shall we say, the beginning of the, the Grimoire tradition, um, just to make it easier to talk about. Uh, because you're, you're kind of dealing with the... So it's a subset of them, but it is a uh, a disordered and uh, deliberately disordered, in many respects, untamable subset of spirits of the air. Because weather, as you point out, is uh, when we're talking big weather, it's the stuff you can't control. It's it's being in the surf, right? It's and that's yeah. uh, that's a really fascinating um, experiential way of understanding something like hierarchy and where crucially you fit in it am i am i pulling on the right threads there yeah yeah that that's that's the direction it's going in and also um as you pointed out when you when you have a um when you have a leader of the spirits who's who's identified helpfully by st paul as prince of the powers of the air it gives you the it gives you the opportunity to recast the way that you work with angel magic um so rather than following the, um, the the Christianized approach, it makes it entirely legitimate to appeal initially to Lucifer as Prince of the Power of the Air, set over those angels and, and command through his authority, rather than reciting um, reciting in the way that, for example, the, you know, the standard Goetia conjurations would be where you, where you have to be allied with Yahweh in order to, in order to effectively work like that. Yeah, the heptameron alignments, if you will, doing those, which I love. I've been I've been playing with them this year, but I know I know what you mean, and I, I think this ties really excitingly with the uh, Lucifer um, weather versus nations concept, because what you have there is the opportunity, if I'm getting this right, uh, to kind of meteorologically experience that uh, Luciferian drama. I guess. Yeah, yeah. I mean, certainly pe- people. People still see magic in far too too abstract a fashion. Uh, I mean, the the epiphanies of the angels are literally the weather, um, and it's the it's the same problem that, that people have when they approach um, mm-hmm. when when they approach yeah when they approach the approach plants and they're kind of like like trying to trying to communicate with spirits or understand where the spirit is. They don't have people will give um, animism lip service. But unless they actually spend time in an environment and understand how inspirited these events are, then then it's just lip service. It's not actually happening. So so the work I'm doing is is very much fitted to you know, both my temperament and proclivities and where I am. I mean, other people will find other other people will find other things based on where they are in the world. Um, and and that's gonna that that to me that to me means getting out into the world, whether that's an urban or a or, or a rural environment or 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 a wilderness, however disputed that term is. Yeah, I, I absolutely resonate with that because I'm, I'm endlessly fascinated, and I, I find it tragic in a way because there there are people who are, are sincerely interested in doing this, and they they bring some unexamined ideas to attempts at interaction and then it doesn't work. And and that sort of getting out into non-human places, for instance, or less human places because Anthropocene, I'll just say that, uh, yeah. less human places is, is one of the things you actually can't skip. And I, I learned that myself. Uh, I, I guess my biggest lesson was doing the sort of, Sybil stuff in the New Forest, actually, was when I realized, wow, um, this isn't one of those um, nice if you can. You you have to do it, and yeah. you have to do it that way. So if it says go out into the woods, you have to go out into the woods. That one, you can't, you can't short-circuit it by yeah. just – and it's great to have a spirit room. If you have a domestic environment where you have a separate room to do magic stuff, congratulations. I am living my best spirit room life down here. But – there are things that require something other than the spirit room, and I, I find, and it's weird. And the plant thing is is obviously very close to my heart as well because it all we bring this uh, almost platonic. We're still bringing the idea that uh, matter is empty and you can put a ghost in it. Uh, and I'm not sure what people expect from a weather event 
or a plant. What, what, and if they think it's that, if they think that the weather event is empty and it's got an angel in it, or a plant is empty and it has a spirit in it, then you've actually yeah. missed the f- the how we do these things phenomenologically, which is that it, it's the full experience of being in the event or being in, you know, being in interactivity with the green or more than human world. And it's, it's funny because, and I, I think this is why I find it tragic. These, like you have a lot of people who are really, really sincerely interested in doing it. And it's in fact easier than what they're trying to have happen. It's just, just yeah. be with yeah. it. It's actually easier. So that like the good news piece is guys, relax, you know, leave all that stuff, leave all that stuff yeah. that's in your head aside and just and be in it. And then subsequently. Yeah. Yeah. And think, yeah, go on. I think the issue is that people, people carry, carry all this material with them and then they override their experience in place. Um, and that's hugely problematic that people enter into a space with, with all of these ritual ideas about what they're going to do and what they're going to see and experience. And it's like the, the first process, the first process is spending time in the space, you know, wh- whether that's, you know, sitting out in witchcraft terms or, you know, whether it's like, you know, going through, going through the season, going through a year with a place, going through, going through the different hours of a place. I mean, you know, as you, I'm sure you found going into the new forests, forests change all the time you know through the day and it's a these are very these are very important core human experiences that we've had particularly um given given the extent of forests like the amount of time that that we've that we've lived in proximity to the forest and its denizens and those times and those senses that we have within us it's critical that people do that it's critical that people spend time in these places and and reconnect with what it is within themselves rather than going you know Rather than you know carrying their carrying their altar into the middle of the woods and reading out a load of nonsense and uh, ignoring what's actually happening around them. Yeah, I, uh, for the last course, I sort of shared a lot of research or some research to do with forest bathing, which I've been very interested in because I want to see what that can look like down here once the accommodation business gets up and running because we have some pretty sweet forests down here, and I don't think. You look at the empirical data that's coming out of South Korea and Japan in particular on the impact of forest bathing. And in the West, we know that it's uh, it's good for reducing biological or, or um, chemical markers of stress. So you have cortisol reduction and, and, and so on when you do things in the woods. But it's more than that. Uh, and, and the effects are so good that if it was a pill, it would be a miracle drug because it's not just that. It's that uh, if you exercise in quote-unquote nature, particularly forests, rather than in a gym, the long-term effects are night and day different. And and you have uh, women in, in Japan who and South Korea who will treat breast cancer with it, so you you go into the woods for a month, and the actual it, something in being in the in the forest actually demasks the cancer cells from the body and allows the body to uh, treat itself. Uh, and, and you think that doesn't that doesn't fit in in any other model other than something to do with humans correctly experiencing a living universe. And I'm I'm just endlessly haunted by. The, the the fact that we have we have data that, that breaks the model that it comes out of, and it's one of those things again. You go, guys, just just be in it, just be in it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Essential. Yeah, I mean that that was the nice thing about traveling to the Pacific Northwest because so many people out there are already doing that. I mean, there, there's a real there's a real sense that the that the forest is on on the edge of the city but also what we noticed while we were there was that well there were there were a series of extreme weather events um that you know we i i couldn't have planned better to you know put behind the information that i was putting forward and there's a real sense um there's a real sense in america um that America, America was previously very much, you know, the place of the future. I mean, so, for example, if we're talking about Jack Parsons and, and what was happening in the West Coast, there was a sense of, you know, this, this great and glorious space future that people were moving into. But what, what we really felt talking to Americans this time was a sense of, a sense of fear about the future um, and a sense, of, a sense of not wanting to look at what was going to come. Um, and allied to that, there was a 
a great sense of displacement in these communities. So, so both Portland and Seattle were um, were feeling the effect of people being driven by climate to relocate, as well as being being driven by by economic um, by economic forces. There's a real sense that um, that that even this this particularly chilled out part of America was on the verge of becoming something new and it wasn't quite sure that it liked what was happening. Mm. It's interesting in the in the second half of the 20th century it was considered this might be an Australian term someone will correct me if I'm wrong but uh, the US was considered the indispensable nation uh, and that makes sense militarily and, and, and politically and so on Cold War etc largest economy and so on and I was listening to a podcast about this on the flight back to Hobart uh, on the weekend and it's still indispensable. It's just differently indispensable. And it's, it's this kind of whatever happens next is, uh, is an upwelling from the literal animal spirits of both the economy and animal spirits that are happening in, in the US. It's fate. And it's more than one fate. And I think this is one of the things I think people are a little bit about is that it's, uh, it, it may look less united by 2030, but whatever happens, it's, uh, yeah, it's 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 indispensable. It's it's whatever happens is sort of flows into what happens to the world. And it was just, I was just kind of thinking about that on the plane, going, yeah, it's still indispensable. It's not in that kind of almost tawdry way of acquiescing to American empire to get access to U.S. consumers. It's in, because we did that for fifty years. It's now indispensable because well, we're we're tied into it, and uh, and and I kind of hope at least some of it goes well. <laughs> Mm. Yeah. Bringing it back to, uh, okay, this is a difficult question uh, because we've been talking about angels of the weather and uh, implicitly angels of nations and so on. Uh, okay, this is difficult. What are angels? Are they always just weather? It's one of those um, catch all categories. Uh, it's the same problem that. that it's exactly the same problem that you find with um, with Goetia of Solomon, um, in that what looks to be a, a, a simple spirit catalogue, when you examine the, the nature and the identity of the spirits, you find that it's a, a whole bunch of refugees from other pantheons. It's, it's very small spirits, it's very big spirits, it's the mighty dead, it's, you know... It's a whole range. So, so the the category of angel, um, you know, which you can, you know, maybe better just see as messenger, um, can be all of these things. It's another one of these terrible catch-all phrases that's been applied to things and has been used in a whole whole range of different ways. So, so there's no easy way to say um, an angel is X. You know, um, so even with the the iconography, if you're looking at, you know, do angels have wings or, you know, are all angels um, humanoid? You find, a, you find a wide range of traditions on that and, and a, wide, a wide range of those traditions through, through from the ancient Near East. Um, the, number of, the number of angels in the Bible is, is, is quite staggering, particularly, um, particularly these, they flourish in, um, in the intertestamental period, which is one of the sort of um, one of the sort of areas that's been considered like a, a dead zone between the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's just kind of oh well, there's the intertestamental period, and nothing really happened until we got Jesus. And mm -hmm. what in fact happened was a, a huge raft of heresies and a huge range of people engaged in um, engaged in angel magic and engaged in um, um, reciting prayers to angels, in crafting talismans, in making the angels appeals. Angels also in that period became more, they had more features personal. They had names. Yeah. They they began to the characteristics became clearer instead of sort of being a generic the angel, but simply they became much more anthropomorphized in a way. Yeah, and individualized. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So they became more. You know, and you can look at that in a variety of ways. You can you can you can also see that like with with discourse with spirits as well, they become more distinct or they present themselves in more distinct ways. Um, they start to make more clear demands about how you pronounce their names and you know, what you offer them and uh, how you discourse. So it's, it's, it's a, angels are a process. 
Um, and, and angels are a, angels contains a whole class of spirits from 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 the mighty dead right through. So um, so yeah, it's a it, it's a very broad term. It's a very broad term, and it's it's only it only seems simple if you if you if you take the simplistic reading and you say these are simply these are the, simply the spirits that, so, that served God and were and were thrown or fell from heaven, um, which clearly doesn't describe the the range of spirits and experiences that you're dealing with. Do you think the the fact that they have sort of multiple tribute there are multiple tributary streams into this term angels is one of the reasons why working with angels is so I almost want to say delightfully unpredictable. Like it's, it is certainly <laughs> unpredictable. And I tend to I still have that kind of capital C chaos interest in just chaos happening. Uh, do you think that's one of the reasons? Do you think there's a sort of a, an error in our, we think we've, because we've, we risk categorizing in too narrow a way and then we interact and it doesn't do what the categorization says. Do you think it's because you are, as you're saying, we're dealing with, uh, all, all manner of, it's almost like, and this is an unfair, this is maybe too simplifying, but it's almost like the word spirit. So this, that's, that's a very broad term because inside it, you have survived gods and weird entities and, and mighty deads and, 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 and um, weather phenomena and astro events and actual stars. And so, and so you're getting this kind of, I, I find this even doing daily heptameron stuff, which has been sort of, I mean, I'd like to say daily, most days uh, this year. has, And that sort of sense of being moved around the board is fundamentally different to, say, the daily planetary prayers of the Hygromantia, which I was talking to Austin about this the other day, have almost like a cooling effect so that it, it, um, it lubricates what could potentially be a rough interaction with a particular planetary force. The, the Heptameron experience is fundamentally different and it just makes life delightfully for the most part weird is there do you think there's something in that yeah uh i think i think magic's about temperaments and the the kind of spirits that people end up working with are based very much on on what they what their temperamental strengths and weaknesses are um so i can see why you would be working with the heptameron um angels i can see why um julio has a liking for uh, hot spirits. I can see why um, Jake has a fuck you punk attitude um, in his relationship to the spirits of Grimorian Verum. It's magic isn't magic very often. From what I see online, when when the rare times that I look online is is people trying to people try to describe magic in the same way that the conversation we just had about angels in that angels cover a huge range of spiritual creatures and a huge range of experiences. And it's the same with magic. Magic, magic is such a broad category, and it contains so many different people. Um, I mean, one of, one of my concerns always when I'm writing about praxis is that people think that I'm telling them what to do, and I have mm. no interest in telling anyone what to do, because everyone's praxis comes out of their personal, conf- their, their personal contact and their personal conflicts. And if my work can be useful because people read it and they, they find something in there that, that they respond to, then that's great. But, but people, people, get a, people look for their validation in, in, in denigrating other people's approach to magic, and I just don't think that's the way to go. No, and it, it, it can't be otherwise. The, the only practice, it's coming back to the surfing, the only practice is, is, is you as human interacting with the more than human. That, like, that is the beginning and end of it. And, and other than that, I've been sort of mulling around in my head. I, I'm not sure if I'm going to turn it into a blog post or something, but just to pick up on what you're saying there, legitimate is not the same as equivalent. So yeah. many of the arguments that, again, I don't spend any time on Facebook or what have you, but many of the arguments I see seem to stem from a confusion between the idea of legitimate and equivalent. Now, yes, uh, if you spend all night in in a full Solomonic uh, circle, dressed up, got the right incense, got the timing correct, and you it, these are these are multi hour operations. Uh, that one, that's obviously legitimate. But two, if you don't do that, if um, if you're 
if you take a more cunning man approach to a, if not the same spirit, then, a, then a, a, a similar one or whatever, it's equivalent. It's not equivalent, but it's legitimate. And I, I don't think people, I just kind of want to tell people to say legitimate yeah. is not the same as equivalent every time there's an argumentative thread about this, because it just seems so, it just seems so weird to me. I mean, wh- why would it, how could it not be like, how could it not be legitimate? And that's fine that it's not equivalent. Yeah, yeah. And pe- uh, I had someone asking the other day on Twitter whether um, over the, this, uh, the cursing of, um, of Kavanaugh, whether it was appropriate to um, make it public that you were cursing. And literally, you know, 500 meters down the street here, the local cunning woman, um, when she was operating, staggered out of the local pub and cursed the Tory MP who was driving his new motor car up and down the street and and broke the broke the motor car with a with a, a stream of invective. Um, and that's the public curse. But on on the other hand, there's a there's a benefit in doing much of the work of witchcraft very quietly and privately. So we, one can do both. Yeah. At the same time. One can do both. And I think I think very often it's difficult um, difficult for moderns in in a in a in a conflict driven environment like the internet to to make that distinction. Yeah, it's it's also unexamined imports from from modern culture as well one of the one of my bugbears is uh, when people say and it, i don't think they realize how capitalist it is but it's like how do i work with my local river spirit and you know, work with this is an interesting choice of words why not play with why not uh, be with also never work yeah 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 it's um, and and that, and it, I, that yeah and i say that and i think I, ho- I hope that kind of sinks in, which is not, uh, it's not a dismissal. Like then we actually discuss, as we were sort of talking about before, being with, um, use of sensing, just the experience of it. I don't think that's work. And I just wonder if, if we don't examine, if we, if we under examine those foundational, uh, concepts, we do end up asking, unanswerable questions like should you publicly or privately curse or how does one work with? And I've, I don't know. I think this year, Versus the last time we had this discussion, I think I'm, I think I'm more bullish that we're getting there. I, um, I, the easiest thing for one's blood pressure to do is to never use Facebook. But outside of that, I actually think, I think it's improving. I don't know. Well, what do you think? Do you think we're, we're like as as an amorphous mass of uh, legitimate non-equivalent people? It's quote unquote getting better. Is it getting better? Yeah, I think there are. I think there's. Um, I think there are some very green shoots, and I, and I think the reason that that things are changing so effectively is that we're finally seeing um, we're finally seeing the old way of doing things and the old power structures breaking down. Um, and by that I mean there have been there have been substantial um, threats to to the orders in terms of their um, their legitimacy. Um, and there have been substantial threats to um, neo-paganism, and both of these have occurred uh, around sexual abuse scandals. Um, and these and the silencing of women yeah. previously, yeah. yeah, and still ongoing actually. And I think what what we really see, um, and and it probably best for Alcus just to speak on this, is that the real shift that's happening is that is that women are coming out and talking, um, and that. That they're finding their voices within the community without um, without the bros talking over them. I don't talk much, so. <laughs> but yes, it's been amazing this year. In particular, I really noticed how many more female voices, women's voices, are just sort of taking, speaking, speaking as they as they want, as they will. <laughs> um, it's just, yeah. <laughs> I don't know what to say about it. Everyone's different. This is what's good. I don't feel like there's a, an attempt to to sound like male practitioners or anything. It's more a, a, maybe it came out of a frustration with the way things were, but I feel that women are enjoying this space now more and seizing it. Is 
Is that magic specific? I, I mean, is it is it one of the is it because magic is in quote unquote culture that we're seeing more of that elsewhere? I mean, tell me, I find that fascinating because well, it's obviously not. I think it's well, it's definitely broader than magic because I see that what happens in magic is usually reflecting or preempting or there's it's always engaged with what's going on in the wider culture anyway. So I, I, it's definitely related to to a more a deeper and a, and a wider scene but um, in magic as well it's it's interesting because I felt that there was a kind of stagnation happening in, in, in a lot of the way people thought about things and women challenge that because women think about things differently women women are different there is difference <laughs> um, I guess and similarity I'm, I'm not making much sense, am I? No, it's, it's good. It's, I, I like it. I think, is it, uh, it's delightfully it's Babylonian. Oh, I don't want to speak for all the other women that might like completely disagree with what I'm saying. Um, but I want, something I'm doing at the moment with Katamara Rosario uh, is bringing together an anthology of women occultists because it, this year it finally, and this is something that came out of uh, Portland, it finally became apparent that there were like, so many talented and intelligent and radical women occultists practicing now with so much interesting to say that I wanted to like gather these voices together and to create something which both like gave strength to everyone in 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 this uh, like so polyphonic sense where all the voices singing their own song but they're singing it also with an awareness of being in a in a larger being um so yeah that's kind of happening <laughs> good yeah and my, my, so my feeling is very much not to speak for other women but to enable other women to speak and to create something which will to, to, to give them a space where there's their, their words are down there on paper and, and for future people to to realize they must just keep going forward and taking taking it on that's splendid i can i can maybe hope that i get uh uh, an improved response rate to to asking women guests on the show than I currently do, and I get why. I spoke about it with Connor and you know and Sarah. I get why. So fingers mm. crossed. Fingers crossed. This uh, the, this place for uh, yeah. yeah for new voices for women's voices emerges. Yeah, yeah. Since we started Scarlet, we always wanted to work with more female writers. For example, every time we brought an anthology together, very few ever came through of the people we approached or. The same with uh, single volume texts, um, and that's a lot to do with the responsibilities or the pressures that are like usually women take the burden of. I think that sort of life intervenes in a lot of cases, and time is much more precious because you tend to get like the child rearing and all of that, you know, whatever other things too. So um, that's really, I think that for me is like a huge shift, and this sense like when uh, the Me Too movement happened was. I became so like I became physically aware of this lifting of something on from my body that I had been used to bearing so much that I was kind of oblivious to it. I had like got used to you know walking around with this stone in my pocket all the time, and this this sense of not being able to react in certain situations, having to be careful all the time, uh, this uh, these kind of things that you you naturalize and. Just being able to speak and having other people speak was a really like it lifted so much and it, it was really transformative for me. So yeah, it's been a really interesting year. <laughs> is that is that Babylon? Are we are we? Uh, is it predicted in the model, if you will? Feels like it to me. <laughs> ah, it's always coming, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's, but, the, that's the threat or the promise. Um, is it Babylon? You can call it that, yeah. <laughs> I think, well, it, 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 from my experience of it, in the sense of experience of observing it and, and being around people who are riding that empowerment, it comes with a lot of uh, correct anger and yeah. uh, a willingness to, you know, have, have that cup fill with the blood of pseudoscience. Like, it mu like the, the cup must be full. Like, blood, blood must pour into this cup. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and this crisis. I mean, the other thing is that you know the idea that 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 Babylon being here is a is a happy thing. Um, people people should probably look at the texts again because the, one of the reasons this is happening is that we have 
an unprecedented assault on women's reproductive rights. We have like uh, we we have a, a bona fide tyrant in the most powerful country in the world, and it's they it's take women highly irresponsible decisions with the whole planet, and it's it's women who are in the front line. Yeah, women who are in the front line, not just in the US, but with the drone strikes and and yep. continuing to do business with Saudi Arabia. And people look at, and you're, <laughs> it's 100% correct, but you look at the, the risks to American women's sovereignty and it's appalling. And you and the same people doing that are the same ones perpetrating uh, all, all wars unevenly land on women and children. And, and look what they're doing. Yeah. yeah, my two favorite records this year have been Hawthorne's The Red Goddess. And of this, men shall know nothing. And Lingua Ignota's All Bitches Die, which are both really strong feminist, strange, magical texts, uh, uh, musics as well, really. So this year hasn't been very much marked by this sense of like a, a wave of, of anger, just uh, starting to break through these bodies and, and to, to move people and to, to, make, to make the voices rise from it. And um, I don't think that's going to diminish. I think that's building. Mm. And I hope it's. Mm. It feels like it. It it feels like the uh, the wave has certainly uh, yet to crest, and uh, and and I hope it. You know, I, I hope it does in the sense that I hope it is building, <laughs> rather than yeah. yeah, you know what I mean. Well, let's like so if there is a sort of wider thing going on, and I think there is, uh, and it appears you guys do as well. One of the manifestations of that uh, is a sort of uneven mainstreaming of witchcraft. If that makes sense, uh, yeah. I, and I'm not sure, like, do we need to? And funnily enough, this sort of occurred to me when you mentioned which it's all, it's almost definitional of Dara. I don't want to say authentic witchcraft. It's almost definitional of, shall we say, historic yeah. witchcraft that it is done in secret. And I'm just wondering, as witchcraft unevenly mainstreams into American chain stores and 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 uh, popular TV shows. In a very specific and and when I say shallow form, I don't actually mean it's not necessarily a pejorative. It's just that witchcraft is deeper than uh, some of its mainstreaming, and there's certainly value in in the sh shallower manifestations of it in culture. Do we need to? How do we think with that? Do we need to sort of redraw boundaries? Do we need to just see where the cards fall first? Because it's we've been talking about it the last couple of times you've been on the show, which is again predicted in the model that the the culture needs to be and is being haunted more and more in a good sense. And this is one of the things that happens. When, when that does, but this year in particular, since we last spoke, the uh, the uneven mainstreaming of witchcraft has has absolutely been a thing. So, thoughts on that? Well, it seems to be tied with a kind of a, a feminist awareness. So, in that sense, I think because people were initially in the, in the the period of the witch hunts. The, the the term witch was applied to people by the power structure. So if people now are choosing to take this word and, you know, fling the curse back, throw the curse back at power, it seems completely legitimate to me to see it in those political or feminist sense. I'm not sure what I feel about mainstream culture. I don't know if I'd even call it culture. It's a kind of... Uh, a fake culture. Mm. <laughs> it's a culture created for people to keep them preoccupied, you know, so like there's always a Netflix or something to to be talking about rather than what's really happening. And you can I see this a lot with the occult. Occult people they they, they love watching kind of like occult films or <laughs> whatever and then reading into it all kinds of signs about their sort of like little spooky hobby or whatever. <laughs> and it's just it's not it's just not it the culture is the thing you do with the people that you are with it's something you make yourself that's that's my understanding of culture um that it's something coming from people and not something given to people as a kind of sop or a pacifier so the the presence of the witch in culture for me is double edged in this sense because on the one hand it's ca capitalism and consumerism responding to signals that it's like picking up, you know, call hunting, which is a call. And on the other hand, it's genuinely something coming through where people are taking recourse to this figure, this idea, this image, this and her powers and understanding themselves through her. So 
it's it's really complex. I don't think there's an easy answer to it, but the, the fact it is coming up so strongly now is very, very, very interesting. Yeah, I would. I, that's a really, really good answer because I, I, I think you got what I meant by shallow in that sense. Then some of it is that, and I'm, I guess I'm happier living in a culture, um, the pseudo culture you mentioned, that sure. has more of it than less. Because if you take a longer view of the story of magic and witchcraft, the the, the pH has been very different at, at at different times. So in one sense, it's quite fortunate to be living through this current apocalypse where you can use the W word in an empowering way, uh, and and not yet be burned uh although we shall see <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah and the culture has changed so rapidly on that because I mean, we can remember you know not not many years ago at all you know that having having wiccans like freaking out because they thought that we were endorsing cursing and that whole and it harm none model of witchcraft has been completely left by the wayside it it's has been completely discredited that's that's no longer it and the, the reason it's no longer it is that is that the people who are responding to witchcraft are largely women and these are women who have been wronged and who are righteously angry and will not will not put up with that bullshit and in in the asymmetric warfare that we're engaged with against the state you know it's any means necessary 100 percent yeah, that's, I, I know it, this is the, uh, I keep forgetting that, you know, something like neo-paganism or um, Wicca still exists in the sense that it's never really been a thing I know much about. But uh, it, if you look at the change in Silly Season articles, it was only about two years ago around Christmas for people who are unaware that's what happens over in news organizations over the Christmas period in particular, where they're on skeleton staff and nothing is happening. You'll, you'll roll out. They somehow managed to find some woman in the Midlands who will say, give the wicker definition of witchcraft. But in the last 18 months or so, the, the sort of public discourse around it has been more what you said. It's been, it's been more about empowerment and, and asymmetric warfare. And that's good. This is actually a good development. Yeah. And I think it's because of the, the phenomena that we're seeing with podcasts and with YouTube is that the mainstream culture has been fragmented um, and that we have a brief opportunity. How long it lasts, how long we have net neutrality is a, another issue. But we have a brief opportunity where where those those narrow voices are not where we have to go for our news sources and they're not where or we have to go or... for our, our validity or our opinion. So I'm not going to get upset because, you know, Walmart are selling some witch kit. That makes that that doesn't affect my authenticity of my practice. It doesn't it has no impact on me whatsoever. Yeah. Um, so it's very strange to see people getting angry about that kind of nonsense. But the witchcraft, the witchcraft that's coming through will destroy neo-paganism. That's that's my prediction. Neo-paganism as it stands, the the writing is on the wall. That mm. that game is over. Yeah, yeah. I, you bring up a good point that I was sort of my observation as well with the um, witch kits and and so on. Is if this has upset you, you want to look at your cosmology, and I mean your entire cosmology, because if it is fragile enough to be encapsulated in a little box with a rose quartz, then the problem isn't the kit. The problem is you 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 need to do some work. You need to do some work on on, on what you think you are and, and how you are in the world because it should not affect you. Yeah. Mm. And anyway, speaking of making culture, Alkistus, we yeah. have to talk about this fancy ass tarot deck you brought out this year, which blew oh. my mind. <laughs> and when we, when uh, Avalon and I did the unboxing, uh, oh. I realized I didn't even know how to pronounce the artist's name. And, and here's this astonishing deck. So, uh, so, so tell us something about it because I can't find enough. I can't find anything about it online. Um, <laughs> what can I say? Radamil approached us about five years ago now with the, the, the major arcana that he'd drawn. And we were just blown away by it. It was incredible. It was such a, he has such a powerful and expressive line and also this very otherworldly quality to his people. And so we were like, yes, we would love to make this tarot deck with you. And then I think like after four years, he got back with a, 
yeah, the rest, <laughs> um, the minor arcana, and they're very different and they're very beautiful. And it, it's, I don't know what to say about it. We just responded completely intuitively to it, and we trusted him as an artist. He's um, not a practicing magician, but as an artist, I think there's such a fine membrane, such a transparent membrane between magic and art that when an artist is deeply intuitive, like Radek Radomil is. I trust their, their, their genius to, to, to manifest what needs to come through. And it's just such an enchanting deck and so elemental. I don't know, it just it, it really opens up part of the, part of the psyche in a, mm. in a way that I find very effective and, and intriguing. So that was that was something just intuition, really. We just felt this was so important. <laughs> well, that's a really good description of it. Inevitably, uh, I I I find the cups astonishing. When I was, I know what you mean about art because I'm looking through it, going, "Oh, I've been here." This is this mm-hmm. is a lot of that uh, undersea imaginal stuff that is is very resonant for me, you know, uh, across my life, uh, and it was amazing. And, and so I thought, there's got to be got to be some kind of story here because I haven't seen a like a, a pip series, the, the cups in that case. Yeah. Look, like it's the major arcana are what people will use to journey or um, do active imagination with most commonly. Uh, yeah. I haven't really done that much with the exception of the solar busca actually, but I haven't really done that much with pips and, and imaginal uh, journey, I guess. But the, in particular, the cups for me were astounding. I think it's, it's a remarkable, uh, a remarkable achievement. Uh, and did, did doing the solar busca help? Like, did you know, okay, so from a, cause they feel different. So they're obviously a different size, but did you have more confidence in, in letting them have that, you know, larger canvas and whatever from a production perspective? Oh, the Solar Busco, we wanted it to be as much, uh, as close to the original cards as possible. So the paper stock we chose, and, and the size is the same as the originals, and the, the paper stock is um, very premium, uncoated paper. So um, I just wanted, and it's only, it's only, um, it's only on the back that it has laminate, so that the the colours are completely unaffected, and the, the feel of it is as close to the old cards that were painted and printed. So there were a lot of constraints with the solar busker, and it was a really, really hard job <laughs> to to manifest that one. It's very, uh, very saturnine. With this one, there was also the experience that helped of working on the solar busker, but we were freer in terms of how we could present them. So we took that experience initial and this was really, again, in the same way that I work with books or text, you respond to the material in front of you and it, it starts to find its own form. It's really about uh, allowing something to come through as it needs to and being like less imposing your personality or your thought on it. But this, like I was saying, uh, the, the response initially was intuitive and the way to, to realize it was intuitive as well. Your personality's in there, though, because you open up the box and there's no little white book for you. And excellent. <laughs> we didn't want anything to interfere with that. It's kind of a bit scary, but that throwing someone directly to the cards and that trust, because I think so, something so important in magic is developing that trust and that, that inner sense. And these cards are really a gift like that. It's uh, like... Uh, because his art is so strong and so effective in its expression and so on that, and this sort of ability to to cause dreams, that I don't think it needed a white book. It was no, yeah, hundred percent. Okay, yeah. and I think it will help people develop also those intuitive capacities more deeply without having to think that there's a text somewhere that will, you know, be the key. The key is in in, in the feeling, in the feeling response, in the kinesthetic inner response to it. Well, see, that's a very Scarlet Imprint thing. That's why I think uh, your personality's in it, because it's just, this is it. You're on your own. <laughs> it's got that, yeah. that the confidence of, like, here is an extremely high quality and, and, and challenging artifact. You're here welcome. It is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Onwards, next. <laughs> yeah, it's been a very busy year. It's been a crazy year. We've been traveling so much, and we've put so much, like, so many more work out than we've previously done. And- it's just been insane. What did, what did come out this but year? Let's, like let's wind this that is, up. This is, a, mm, this is something to do with like the, the times. It's not like us. It's 
like, everyone is swept up in this wave and mm. it, it just mm. felt that this year we had to totally respond to to that what did that come out this year <laughs> hmm? what did come out this year and actually as we're towards the end of the show tell us what came out this year and uh, and what's coming up you mentioned excellent book which of course i'm looking forward to but um what did you do this year Oh, uh, we started with Jin Sorcery mm. by Rena Alim. Uh, then we did um, Ayes Latas' 72, which was the Book of Demons and a print. Uh, then we did Julio Cesar Odi's uh, Magister of Fishuram. And then we did the Tarot, and then we've just done Frater Asher's Holy Diamond. So, like, lots. Yeah. <laughs> uh, is Brazen Vessel coming out this year? Uh, hopefully, or early like January. Yeah, we're we're going to we're going to Paris for We've been derailed again. <laughs> and then we back. We come out from Paris and we go to Berlin. We go to Berlin talk. for um, this huge Berlin occult, occult. Mm. occult festival, festival that appeared out of nowhere. Um, and so immediately after that, we're going to be we're going to be we're working on the edit, <laughs> and then it's a question of whether we can get it through the get it through the printers in time. We aim to get it done by the end. Of the, we aim to get and it done by the end. And knowing what printers sure. are like, and knowing what end of year printing is like, I think it's more likely to be January than this year. But but our we'll aim be is on it. our aim is this year. Mm. And so, if it's that'll be realistically, hopefully, uh, end of yeah. the year, beginning of next year, and then after that is excellent book. Uh, the excellent book. Well, but before that, we're, it's uh, missed by uh, Peter Mark Adams. So Peter Mark Adams' new work. Which oh yes. Is yeah, on the frescoes of the Villa de Misteri and the ritual um, vocabulary of these uh, female initiation rites, then it's an excellent book. <laughs> so 2019 may well end up being kind of busy as well. Yeah, I'm getting yeah. used to it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's not been a lot of off time at all. Yeah. In, um, tense. Well, sorry to hear that, but also good, because good. I, I good. like your stuff. <laughs> <laughs> all right well um i love these chats I, I, there's been a couple of times throughout the year because it's been such a dramatic year i'm like nah, i should get the scarlet on i'm like no must stick to annual tradition so uh i've been, li- <laughs> I, <laughs> I've been looking forward to this episode for literally a year and uh and it's been an absolute pleasure uh of course scarletimprint.com is where people can go and, and look at the books and, and read articles and so on. But where else can they go to, to find out more? Oh, I've got a website too, alkasystemek.com, but that's just for my dance material. Um, where I, I try to find time to, to live my other life. <laughs> <laughs> as well, the makeup. Nice. And both on the Twitters and all that kind of stuff will be in yep. the show notes. Um, all that crap. <laughs> yeah where, where you would expect oh yeah you actually because i don't use instagram but i um sometimes sometimes people share that stuff on on uh, twitter and yeah obviously because you make such marvelous objects you have and live somewhere so beautiful you have a very good uh instagram to uh to check out so i'll make sure that's in the show notes as well but an absolute pleasure as always uh getting your opinions on on the state of the many worlds and 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 so on and weather events and so yeah <laughs> thank you very so, much yeah, great to catch up yeah oh but i love those two very much It's always helpful for me to get Alkistus and Peter's perspectives on both the trends within the magical world and the external trends influencing it from the outside. A couple of things I have been pondering since we recorded the show. Thinking with angels as dramatic weather events is useful for going deeper in the metaphysics of spirits of the air, as mentioned on the show. It also has, as Peter alluded to, contemporary political ramifications that certainly suit a cycle model, given the prominence of national borders and walls and so on around the world in today's public discourse. There's also a ufological overlap, particularly with the work of Jacques Vallée around the association between unusual or extreme weather events, you know, storms, bull lightning, uh, strange or fast-moving clouds, which I think opens up yet another way of getting into a wider and more useful or interoperable metaphysics. 
And with regards to Alkista sharing her thoughts on what we might call today's feminism clothed with the sun and the moon under its feet, it seems to me that whether it's an upwelling from within the magical world or an introgression from outside it is mostly an artificial distinction and one that brings us back to my favourite mechanism. Uh, if it's real, it can take the pressure. For whatever it's worth, uh, my opinion on these matters, so for whatever it's worth, is that the upwelling is universe-wide, so to speak. I think this particular form is ascending from the depths much closer to the surface of the collective unconscious, and the whole world is, I guess, staying with the Jungian description and using the terms in that sense, coming to terms with this experience. Anyway, be sure to check out scarletimprint.com for some essays and thoughts associated with the topics we discussed today and find both Alkistus and Peter on your preferred socials. All of that is in the show notes, of course. Please do let me know what you think at runesoup.com or the RuneSoup Facebook page and find me on Twitter where I am Gordon, G-O-R-D-O-N underscore white, W-H-I-T-E. Until next time. <laughs> <laughs>